for the fe- seven sempo jangas to be developed, satipatthana is the most important thing Sayadaji mentioned yesterday. And for this most important satipatthana to happen, within the large fields of observation of kaya, vedana, citta, and dhamma, matter, feeling, consciousness, and general objects, with every newly arising object, if one applies art and effort to observe and sati sticks to the object, and samadhi falls collectively on the mind. When these three, virya, sati, and samadhi, develop full energy, then knowledge arises stage by stage. But sometimes the mental, the mentality doesn't always go, uh, the path isn't always straight. So sometimes thoughts thoughts come in and when one hasn't seen the results one wants and then the mental energy falls, it drops. And sometimes our mind is overactive. So neither of these is good. The mind shouldn't be slack but it also should not be overly active. It needs to be balanced in the middle. And so if one of these things happens, if one of these uh, things just mentioned happens, then in the text it says how to correct the situation and so that the yogis can know in advance how to deal with these two situations. Sayadawji would like today to speak about this. When we do something that is correct in order to bring benefit, if we work correctly to bring benefit, and... Seeing the situation, when we have the good opportunity to do the work, then we need to work at it. And without work, the benefits won't come. So while we're doing this work that brings benefit, at the start, because those benefits haven't yet developed, then a disgusting type of mental behavior comes in. And this is called kosaja. It means literally disgusting, uh, disgusting, despicable behavior. And <clears throat> if one doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, take care of what is good for oneself, if one neglects working for one's own benefit, then those around one are likely to say, that person is really lazy. And they may not say it, but they may think it. So this uh, lazy behavior is, it comes from letting one's energy drop, reducing one's virya, one's courageous effort. Not knowing what is good for one beneficial for one, one lets one's effort drop. And then the environment, those around one, blame blame that person, criticize that person. Especially this can happen when one is doing this work, which brings, which helps us to be a true human being. And it It uh, gives us the way to develop a humane mind, a human heart. And it brings special knowledge that the ordinary human doesn't have. So when we try to do this work, 
when we're practicing, if the benefits, the results haven't yet arisen, then this slack mind, this, this slack mind can occur. And then laziness enters the mind. So if this is the case, then the Buddhist text prescribe a method to cure this situation. And today, Sierroji would like to speak about this. So this retracted mind, the mind that is withdrawn, it occurs for the practicing yogi when one hasn't seen the nature of the Dhamma yet and the noting isn't going well. So, and it can also um, happen when we expect to gain some more knowledge, but we haven't yet seen it. This time, at that time too, the mind can become withdrawn. Or uh, one may be progressing, the Dhamma, one's practice may be progressing, but, but the thought comes in that one isn't. One thinks that one isn't progressing. And then, too, the mind can become withdrawn and retracted. So in the text it says, Linang Chitang, Kosa Janu Patitang. So this retracted, withdrawn mind, uh, the state of lazy, this disgusted, disgusting, despicable behavior of laziness, tends to follow that, um, that lazy mind, that neglect, that um, withdrawn mind. It falls into this disgusting behavior. And in the, at that time, the mind doesn't want to do anything. So if, if we think about when we're trying to work to gain ordinary education, or when we're working for a living. This can happen too when, when our expectations haven't been met. We haven't seen what we expect to see. And pretty much everyone is like this. This type of mind can come up. So for yogis who aren't practicing systematically, it's not, uh, it's not right that they should feel uh, this type of their expectations not being met because systematic practice is necessary. We should understand that. So one has to practice systematically and we have to uh, get, get the advice of the teacher and we have to follow that advice. So when we um, when we're working to get material goods, then we make an effort. We make an effort to make the, get what we need. So in this, um, if we don't make effort, then we will lose. So if we don't make effort, then laziness enters in and one loses what one could have gained. So this is what can happen to the yogi. And this also happens when yogis can't be patient. You know, they've, um, they can't be patient. It's taken, they, um, their practice is taking a long time. And um, the teachers speak uh, frankly with them to try to get them to correct, to correct themselves. And this, uh, in this case, the yogis can't be patient with the correction and they leave. This occurrence is a danger to Vipassana Samadhi. The observation in one's body of every observable object with steadfast sati so that kanika samadhi, momentary samadhi, arises. This is a danger to that samadhi. And when there is a danger, a threat, then there is something to be feared. What can happen in this case is that enemies can arise. 
and here especially Kilesa enemies. These Kilesa enemies have to be repelled. So these are the cause of suffering, of all of our suffering, and they cause us to bring harm to others. So we shouldn't spare the Kilesas of Loba and Dosa. They don't spare us. So one should understand that they are a danger. And as soon as they arise, one should observe them. And one should observe them until they go away. According to the method that Sayadawji just mentioned, um, if this if if one tries to observe the kilesas that have arisen and although one tries they overwhelm one again and again then one needs to find a method for boosting up the mind and that is in the text tam tam paganit so when one boosts up the mind one has to boost up the mind encourage it and this will dispel this um, disgusting state of kosaja laziness. There are 11 methods for boosting up the mind in the commentaries. And Sayadawji will speak about these when he gets to the section on wiriya. But for now, he will just speak in a general way. If one doesn't apply a suitable amount of virya, courageous effort, then one's uh, courage, one courage, one's courage, it um, weakens. It weakens so that we don't have the courage to avoid doing the things that should be avoided. And we don't have the courage to undertake and develop the things that should be done nor do we have the courage to admit our faults. So one's courage becomes very weak and um, base. So then one goes downhill, and this can affect our environment because one uh, one doesn't undertake this work successfully to that, would, that can make one a true human being. Oh, this work that makes one a true human being with a truly humane mentality and that brings knowledge that is special. If one can't do this work, then this affects those around one. It's similar to what happens when one is driving a car and Uh, in a country where one drives on the right, instead of driving on the right, one drives on the left. So if you drive in the wrong lane on the highway, you are going to have an accident very quickly. So human problems, uh, many, many human problems arise because of this type of, this phenomena. And for monks, uh, if they do not have the courage with regarding their sila, samadhi, and panya, then the things which are donated to them are practically wasted. If one corrects the situation with a suitable method, then it is said, evam pichitang na wikepang gachati. When one boosts up the mind and dispels the laziness, then the mind becomes normal again. It doesn't become scattered anymore. It doesn't become separate from the object, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't go far away from the object. It, um, instead, one's noting becomes good again, and one is able to note as though the mind and the object are, they're united. This is very important. Sometimes the yogis have strong energy, 
and one after another, the, the observation is connected, the observation is meticulous, and the mind is clear. And then piti, joy, joyous interest arises, and one feels, uh, one may feel like one is floating, and so on. So one, one gets elated by this, and this is a type of enjoyment. So uh, the mind becomes elated, and then one has to control it because it's too active. So uh, when there's too much energy, too much furia, then one can miss the object. So Sierauji spoke about how when he was young, in throwing darts, uh, he had to aim, you know, from the place where he could hit the bullseye, hit the target, and of course he had to apply effort. And sometimes, when there was too much eagerness, then uh, there's he applied too much effort, and then he missed the target. So one has to aim carefully. Uh, in this situation, and one, um, if one doesn't reduce one's uh, zeal, one's efforts, then one will just keep on missing. One has to, one, one has to make sure that one's aim is very, very accurate at that time, and not let the effort be excessive. So when the yogis are watching the rising and the falling, one after another. And if they have, um, if they apply too much, if their mind is too anxious to observe the object, then it's said that the, uh, the over-energized mind is followed by restlessness. Odicca is what follows this mind that is overly concerned with hitting the object. So if this happens, one has to kind of um, reduce one's mind and there's there's many ways for doing this in the text but the way that Sayadaji speaks about this one method is that to just uh, tell yourself okay I'll just note what I can you know and I, it, so what if I miss but I'll just try to note carefully and note whatever I can and when one reduces one's effort in that way and aims to be accurate, then one's, no, one's, one's mind becomes balanced again and one is able to observe the object properly. So one has to be careful about this. Those who have too much concern about observing the object miss. That can happen. So when one uh, just is calmly noting whatever arises as one as they come, just with a calm, relaxed mind, then one can then one can, this doesn't happen. This type of over over concern about hitting the object. But those who have too much concern, like I've got to get it, I've got to get every object. I missed it. I'm not going to miss it again that type of thing, um, that, that makes one miss the object. And also thoughts coming in, thoughts come in such as, did I note it or not? So if this happens every time one observes an object, the thought comes in, did I note it or not? Then the mind is going to become separated from the object and the noting is no longer going to be effective. So the mind, uh, because the mind is not meeting the object head on directly, the mind separates from the object and then it becomes scattered. It's like it flies away. It's like, uh, it's like being, it's being tossed away, far away. So this is called vikepa. The mind is not just separated from the object, but one's thoughts multiply so, and, and then, then one can waste a lot of time in, in this 
multiplying thoughts. So people who think and who, who believe that thinking is the way to learn because, of their, um, because they've learned this way in school. Um, you know, they've taught, learned to analyze, to ask what is it. So if one is attached to this analysis, then when one comes to practice, because one has the habit, the mind can be scattered. So this is called, this scattered mind is called vikepa. And this is a danger to vipassana samadhi, as mentioned in the text. Some people grate their teeth and clench their fist in determination to observe the object. They're, they're determined not to miss anything and it even gets to the point of them clenching their jaw. So this is not, uh, the Dhamma is not to be observed in this way. The Dhamma is that uh, one should be, just let oneself breathe normally and just calmly every time an object arises one should observe it so as not to miss it. This is the yogi's job. So if instead of just doing this in a regular way, uh, that if one instead grates one's teeth, grits one's, clenches one's jaw, makes one's hand into a fist and is uptight about observing the object, then the mind is going to become restless. The odicca is going to arise and the mind will scatter. So if one feels that one is trying all out, one is trying, but nothing is happening, then one should understand it is because of this type of over-concern about observing the object. When there's too much concern to observe the object and this happens again and again, then one won't be able to note properly. So therefore, if this excessive concern arises, one has to note it with a calm mind. And the mind will then, uh, then the mind and the object will meet exactly the mind will become balanced and the mind will be able to observe the object accurately. So also, when one is applying effort and, um, and, then, and one is overly concerned about the object and not able to observe the object, then one should just, um, just tell oneself, okay, I'm going to know what I can. That's all. That's all I can do. I'm just going to know what I can. And when one suppresses the... Um, when, one, when one does that, that balances the mind so that then the mind is able to observe the object properly. One has to not let the mind be slack and one also has to not let the mind be too tight, too overly concerned. So it has to be in the middle. And when the effort is slack, one has to boost it. And when the effort is too excessive and the mind is too tight, then one has to relax it. And just by doing that, just by boosting, in the case where it needs to be boosted, or um, letting the mind relax in the case where it's too tight. Just by doing that, the mind, uh, the situation, the mind becomes balanced at that time. It falls in the middle and then the mind is stable. So in, in summary, if our practice is slack, then one has to encourage oneself and the meditation teacher also seeing the situation. If the mind is lazy, the 
the teacher has to also correct the yogi in this in this uh, situation, encourage the yogi, boost them up. And if the mind is too tight, overly active, then one has to relax it. So if one understands that one has to make this type of adjustment, then when these tendencies come up, one can adjust and the mind will become balanced again. And in this way, the kanika samadhi of vipassana can um, develop and knowledge arise. So this is how to note when the mind is slack and not making enough effort and how to note when it is overly active. So when one travels on a road that has been broken, the road is open and people are going on this path. And one understands the path, one knows it, and one can see any dangers, and one also knows the safe way to go. So when this happens uh, time and again, then one, when one observes the rising and the falling, the mind becomes concentrated through making effort, sati, and then samat, the mind becomes collected. Kanika samadhi becomes good. And then vipassana knowledge develops stage by stage. And in this way, as we go along practicing, the indriyas, the faculties, become balanced. Especially when one reaches the stage of observing the fast arising and passing away of phenomena. The mind is clear and one sees how the objects arise and then pass away in a fleeting manner very, very quickly. And then one's faith becomes very strong. Faith becomes a ruling faculty as well as a power. And then also, because of one's faith, one's effort also becomes stronger. Before, when one applied effort, one had to work to make sure one's effort was right. One had to work to observe the object. But now, one's effort is effortless. There is no need to make any special effort the effort just goes by itself. So at this time, uh, it's like driving on a good road in a good car. One can just cruise along. And so at, at that time, our virya also is a ruling, an indriya and a bala, a, a ruling faculty, as well as a power. And to the extent that our effort is good, sati also becomes much, much better. Our sati doesn't miss at all. It doesn't even miss small things, very tiny things. It too is elevated to the level of indriya and bala, ruling a ruling faculty and a power. And to the extent that our sati is good, our samadhi, concentration, also becomes powerful and becomes a ruling faculty. As good as our samadhi is, then when the mind, uh, when the mind, because the mind is also meeting exactly with the object, knowledge arises. And this is the ruling faculty of panya, or wisdom. It too is a power and a, and a ruling faculty. So if one reaches this point, one is sure to, well, then, then please continue, because one is sure to gain special knowledge. So now at this time, one should consider for oneself faith, the, the factor of faith is present and strong. Honesty, health, 
So honesty, the mind is upright, the health is good, and one is making effort, the effort is strong, and one sees the fast arising and passing away of phenomena. So all these factors, these five factors, which Sayadaji has spoken about before, are complete. So one can look at oneself and decide for oneself. One can know for oneself that this is the case. So at the present time, when one is able to speak clearly and express themselves well without hesitation, that, and uh, then such a yogi, if such a yogi practices respectfully, meticulously and without a break, within one week they can reach this stage. Yogis who are able to speak clearly and express themselves well. And such a yogi is sure to reach this stage in two weeks. So if, on the other hand, a yogi's, what a yogi says is clear, but they aren't very um, quick to express it. It takes some time to express it. Then it takes longer. It can take that person longer, uh, maybe three weeks. So if, if one speech is not clear but confusing, and one also... Um, it takes one longer to speak. It's, one is more hesitant about speaking than it takes much longer. So there are four kinds of people. And some people, there's, what they say is both confusing and they say it uh, quite slowly. They're not quick in being able to speak. And for such people, it takes a very long time so when interviewing a yogi, if that yogi's speech is clear and they can speak uh, well about, they can express themselves well, then the yogi just has to do what the teacher says, the yogi does it, and then after a short time, the practice just does itself. There's no need for the yogi to be the teacher to encourage the yogi because the yogi has the yogi sees how to practice and they are able to um, they see the benefit and then they just go. So some people are what they say is clear, but they're uh, slow in speaking and. So that, can, that takes a person longer. That means it will take the person longer. So when, one's, I, when, when what is happening is very clear to the teacher and the, and the yogi is able to express that, then the teacher is quite satisfied because the yogi can see, um, the, yogi, the teacher can see how, what the yogi is doing from what the yogi says. It's very easy to see. And they can see that the way they practice is clear. So this type of yogi uh, is, the meditation teachers love this type of yogi. And Sayadawji said that to become like this, to be able to be clear in what one says, to be able to communicate, uh, to be clear about what one has seen in the practice and to be clear about expressing it to the teachers. Sayadawji urges all of us to work to be like that. <laughs> <laughs>